Hello and welcome to this week's Australian Stock Market Report. This week we'll look at self-managed super funds and why they might be better than industry funds. Then we'll get into the Australian stock market so that I can share with you my thoughts on where it's heading along with answering your questions and looking at stocks for you. I'm Janine Cox, Senior Analyst at Wealth Within and we're Australia's most trusted stock market educators. Before we move on, thank you for showing your support for our channel and hitting that subscribe button. As you subscribe, click the bell on the right of it so you keep up to date with our latest videos. Also, tune in to our live Australian stock market show every Tuesday, 7 to 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Time. This is the show where you get to ask us, the stock market education and trading experts, to look at your favourite stocks and answer all of your questions. According to a recent report from the Australian Tax Office, there are over 600,000 self-managed super funds with total estimated assets of around $876 billion which accounts for almost 25% of all superannuation funds. The ATO also reported that over 50% of self-managed super funds were set up over 10 years ago, and the establishments of new self-managed super funds has been on the decline for several years. So is this a sign that investors no longer want control of their investments? We need to remember that the vast majority of the growth in self-managed super funds came after the GFC crash, as so many were disenchanted with their managed fund returns and their advisors who were telling investors to hold for the long term. For many, it was a hard pill to swallow as they were sitting on portfolios that had fallen 50 to 70%. As the market runs in cycles, I'm confident that we'll see another sustained market fall in the second half of this decade. When this occurs, investors will repeat mistakes of the past and watch their managed superannuation fall away heavily again, and the cycle will continue with a large number of investors becoming disenchanted, wanting to exit and set up a self-managed super fund. Right now, around 28% of the assets in self-managed super are invested in listed shares, which means they're important to our stock market. But the industry continues to propagate that self-managed super funds are too hard and too costly to run. Although my experience is the exact opposite. There are many providers with low cost services that assist self-managed super trustees to set up and properly manage a self-managed super fund. And with a good education, anyone can achieve solid returns on their superannuation and rival or beat the managed fund returns. The streets are littered with those who make decisions after a major event that costs them dearly. But surely the wise thing is to ask yourself right now these two questions. What if the market falls heavily and how will I protect my superannuation? Remember, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Now it's time we take a look at the market. But before we do, if you're listening to this video on your favorite podcast app, then help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a nice review. That brings us to what are the best and worst performing sectors this week. The best performing sectors include financials, utilities, and consumer staples, with all currently up under 1% for the week. The worst performing sectors include information technology down over 1%, followed by healthcare also down over 1%, and consumer discretionary down just under 1%. The best performers in the ASX 100 stocks include Northern Star Resources up almost 7%, followed by Evolution Mining up over 5%, and AMP up around 4%. The worst performing stocks include the A2 Milk Company down over 8%, followed by Pilbara Minerals down over 7%, with ResMed and Fisher Paykel Healthcare both down over 5%. So what do I expect in the market moving forward? Well, let's get into the charts for our S&P 500 All Ordinaries Index update for this week. We'll also answer your questions and look at the stocks that you've chosen for me. Now, so far, it's been a reasonable week on the Australian market in that we've seen the market holding pace with where it closed last week. That's a really important thing. The market's just steady, really, more than anything. And we've seen some of the big stocks on our market uh, moving from lows to highs in that process for the week. But look, I really want to get to the charts now. And I think it's important for me to tell you that we are talking today during 
market, so this is Thursday during the day, so the market hasn't closed yet. So what we're looking at today are actually yesterday's prices. I, I think that's really important to mention. What happens today before the weekend, the market's been up so far um, this morning, but there are a few stocks that have really struggled. So it's really going to be one of those days just before the Easter weekend. And this often happens before the long weekends that um, people are often thinking, oh, gee, I'm going to run out of days to trade. And so then you see this rush to get into some stocks, which generally eases off um, towards the end of the day. So um, look, without further ado, let's get into the chart, shall we? So looking on the screen there, you can see that I've got the monthly chart of the All Ordinaries Index. Now this is actually a chart that I've uh, grabbed from Dale's workbook. So he's talked to you about the movements of the All Ordinaries Index over the previous year or so a um, number of times and as it's been unfolding. And you can see there, I just want to recap on what's happened because we're seeing that each time the market's pulled back, the falls have actually been quite um, low in terms of the historical movements that we see on the All Ordinaries Index. Now at times the market will pull back anywhere between 8 and 15% when it does. And that's not considered a crash. When they ring the bell to say that there's going to be a market crash, they're talking about uh, corrections of around 20%. The funny thing is though, often when the market does get around to those levels after they've rung the bell, that it turns around and goes back up again. But at the moment, we're dealing with a market that's far less volatile, potentially is going to be um, even though the recent pullback was almost in line with the US market, it was less, but you would think that our market is going to be less volatile because we've got the influence of the mining sector, which has been quite resilient, as well as the financial sector, which is doing quite well. So looking back there on your screen, you can see that each time the market's fallen, it's around that 6, 6.5 percent. And then the recent fall that we've seen here, around 11.6 percent. Now, as you will have heard Dale say a number of times, it, it, there is the potential until the market goes through its high, its all time high, there's always the potential for the market to come back and take out that low. It's getting less so now that the market has actually moved on, but it's possible that our market will continue to go up um, over the coming weeks, but it also may get trapped in this sideways move in the short term. So we may see a bit more of this sideways consolidation, which mind you, our market's been trading sideways really since June, which is quite interesting when you think about it. And when markets go into these sideways ranges, often you can get whipped out of stocks and then not long after be um, seeing entries for opportunities to get back in again. It's all about what's happening with the RBA, of course, and inflation and the cash rate movements. We're seeing a turning point, but we're at the very early stages of that. And I think there's a lot of fear mongers out there trying to make people concerned about how fast they could raise the, the cash rate. Uh, it'd be reasonable to think that they'd raise at half a percent, but anything over one percent, I think, in the short term would be highly unlikely, given that things are in a bit of a state of flux at the moment. So looking at the chart there again, you can see that so far for the for the week, and we'll move to the weekly chart quickly. Uh, Dale's beautiful um, image there of the way that he expected the market to unfold this year is still on the screen. Now you can see that the high of last week's bar was actually up around 7,880 points, still shy of the all-time high, which was in January at 7,956 points. Now what's interesting to me is the XJO, which is actually our top 200 companies, and I'm not going to bring that up on the screen, but that high is actually lower than the prior peak that occurred back in August 2021. So that tells me that we've had a really nice unfolding into the low, which the all lords is a bit deceiving in that way in that it would lead people to think that it's a really strange situation here. You've got a climb to a new all time high and then just three weeks straight down. But the biggest stocks on our market um, had pushed the market down in a different way, along with those stocks outside the 100. And now we're seeing a challenge to that high again. So far, after seeing these four weeks up, it's a beautiful rise that we've seen on the market. It's possible we could have another week down um, and that will really tell us whether the market's going to continue to fall, pull back from here or whether it's going to push higher. But in, you know, in, in terms of the short term perspective, we really need to see the market get back above 7,800 and around 50 points and move with some strength 
in the upward direction to be confident it's going to keep going. So at this point, and don't tell Dale I agreed with him, but I think I agree with his analysis at this point. Unless the market takes out this week's high next week straight away, then we might be going to a new all-time high more quickly than what the chart's showing there for you. But he's suggesting there's a potential for a pullback into June. And as we head further towards that time period, we'll have a much better and clearer picture. It's just taking each week at a time. So I hope you've enjoyed the discussion today. And, and just remember, um, if you haven't grabbed a copy of Dale's book at this stage, you want to understand more about charting and analysis and, and how to really understand the big picture as well as when to buy and sell, then that's a really worthwhile book to read, a bit of bedtime reading perhaps there for some of you. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. I look forward to answering your questions. Let's get into the questions for today. Now, the first question we have today is from Matthew. Hi, Dale, just a quick question. You mentioned on your video about training your traders. Do you have an online course that I could use to improve my trades? I use a lot of TA indicators on the charts and use a lot of Fibonacci retracements on the monthly, weekly and for hour to gauge where I see support or resistance. What do you recommend on the fibs to use just the monthly or daily to get a sense of movement on the trend? Now that's really interesting isn't it? Um, daily charts are really not going to tell you anything about what's happening with the trend. In fact if you happen to watch our show on Tuesday night we had a great example of where people get fixed on looking at daily charts and trying to preempt what's going to happen with the trend and then can get sucked in to thinking that the trend has changed when it actually hasn't. So it's always best to take a bird's eye view and look at the big picture first, that long term chart, monthly chart, which is why we do refer to that chart quite often to show you a bird's eye view of what's happening and whether the trend's likely to have changed. And the weekly chart really hones it down and that's really powerful to be using some of those levels that you're talking about. In, on the weekly chart analysis. But I know that if you made the decision and commitment to yourself to do the study, do the course, that you would understand how all of that comes together. It's just amazing. I, I can tell you that um, when you get to module four, it's like the light turns on in the, in the diploma course. You can see how stocks resonate and move to some of these levels, but it just explains it and ties it in a lot better because you can't look at things in isolation. And I think that's what people try to do when they're learning in an unstructured way. So that's really my tip for you is to just have the confidence and just invest in yourself and go and do it so that you really understand how to use all of these fib levels and resistance and support levels and how they tie in with the movements and recognizing the trends. Well, that was a great question. And thank you so much for raising that one. We have another question from Sand Hill. Hey Dale, thank you for the session. What do you think of SYR at the moment? Mm, very interesting stock. Shall we go and have a look at the chart? We've got SYR on the screen right now. S um, YRH, so Syria, I think it is, resources. It's probably not a stock that I would follow necessarily, but it's actually reasonably liquid looking at the weekly chart. We can see the bars look like they're performing normally, but then still has a certain level of volatility that allows you to trade it. And it trends reasonably well, although most of the time it's spent so far trending down. Look at that volume coming in there. We can see increasing volume. That's not necessarily saying it's going to rise though at this stage. It would need to get above this um, peak here, which is last week's high of $1.80 to really indicate that it's more likely to keep going up. But I think it looks quite good on the long term picture. It's possible that this stock could be trading around 280, a three dollar mark um, if it does make that move that I was just referring to on the weekly chart. And this is where it can get confusing for people because they can hit, stocks like this will often get put into broker reports and they'll be talking about it and it's in that resources sector. So it often seems more sexy to people to be buying stocks in that area. But I would say to you just trade with the, the move. Don't try to trade against it. If you already own the stock, I'd be pretty happy with the share at the moment, although it can take you on a wild ride. Just to have a look at how this stock moves, we can see that 
really, we had a fall of 40% just over a few months. So you've got to be, you've got to have your wits about you when you're making a decision about the type of rules to use. But I can see just looking at it, and this is not a perfect trend line or anything. I'm just drawing a line underneath the rise, but we can see it's got good support to continue that move up, which is a really important sign. So as I said, if we get a strong rise above 180, it could continue to go up and could head anywhere between $283 and at best case, somewhere around the 350 mark. So um, just make sure you've got a good stop loss and a good set of exit rules. Now we've got a third question, really keeping us on our toes here, guys. Good to see some good questions coming in at the moment. We've got a question from Bob. Hey Dale, what do you think of AGL at the moment? Looks like it's trending nicely at the moment. Now let's just have a look at the chart there. This is quite an exciting stock to look at AGL coming off that low. AGL is not a simple beast to trade, let me tell you, simply because it's been on a long-term decline We've had um, corporate actions going on potentially here. So we've got a demerger with the company that you must read up about if you're thinking about buying shares in a company. You must go to their um, website, have a look at the announcements, understand if there's any corporate actions, class actions, things that could disrupt the share price and cause it to fall out of bed for any reason. A demerger is not necessarily a negative thing. It's probably a good thing for AGL and could unlock value in the shares. It's a question of how much further it's going to rise before that happens. Do you want to have two shares? What does that mean for your portfolio? Because if you're structuring your portfolio well, you'll be picking stocks according to how they, they are potentially ranked. So you might have a portfolio that you're just looking for top stocks in the top 50 or 100. And if when the companies demerge, if some of the stocks that are demerged fall outside of that, you may no longer be able to hold them anyway. So it's really important to understand that big picture about what's happening with the demerger with AGL. And then we've seen some companies make offers for the share. So that's largely been driving it up recently. We've seen a company come in and the last offer I think was $8.25. The stock has gone in excess of that. Potentially the market's looking for another offer to come through. Now, you know, historically when there's been a number of offers on the table for a share, it's very unlikely to rise more than say 10% from that level, maybe 15%. Um, it just depends on whether you get an, a second bidder coming in there, but we haven't seen anything to that effect um, occurring at this stage. So you just have to be mindful of that and what could happen after that point. And on the chart there, if we look at the monthly chart, we can see that lovely move up. Now it's moved up for what, five straight months without a correction. Now what's happened in the past on the chart, we can see that it went up for five months here and then pulled back. How long does it tend to go up? before it pulls back, well, it's, it's very rare for it to go up more than around five months uh, without a pullback. Now, sometimes it could go up for eight months and then have a pullback, maybe not as strong. The situation um, here with this all-time high was different to how it had unfolded anywhere in the past. So it's something to bear in mind right now in terms of short term. If you're a real short term trader, and you're looking to keep a tight stop on your, your position, then that may be different in terms of whether you go in that. But if you're looking more medium term, there's a lot of questions there and there may be better value elsewhere and opportunities elsewhere. So I hope you've enjoyed the discussion today on stocks and you don't have Dale with you today. Um, and I'm sure you're probably missing Dale and, and maybe thinking, um, where is he? But he, he does get to have a holiday as well. So, and I think it's really important for um, you guys to get a different perspective sometimes that when I'm talking about shares on the show and, and Dale's discussing shares, we have something additional for you that the other may not have um, thought at. So we really appreciate all your emails and your messages and requests for a response on stocks. And remember, to get the best chance to have your question answered is um, to publicly subscribe to our channel and then type your question below in the comments section. Again, if you're listening via our podcast app, please remember to give us a five-star review. Also, remember that here on this channel, we do these Monday market reports every week and also do a live stream every Tuesday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Time. So we look forward to seeing you all next week. And remember, hit that subscribe button now and click the bell on the right of it 
So that way that you know when we upload and go live. I'm Janine Cox, goodbye, good luck and good trading.